So welcome everyone, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Michal makov Peled, and I'm the Director of Development for the Schechter Institute. Um, I have big shoes to fill today as I'm hosting instead of Rabbi David Belinking, who is on his way flying back from New York uh, after spending the high holidays at Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur over there. So um, I hope I will be uh, gracious enough <laughs> as, as he is. Uh, and of course, excuse my English and my Israeli accent, um, but I'm very excited, very happy to have you here today for our um, starting to be traditional Zooming before the holidays. And today we are Zooming into Sukkot. And with the, no uh, further ado, I'd like to um, give uh, um, Rabbi Benjamin Siegel. Um, he's the past president of the Schechter Institute, and he's also the author of Kohelet's Pursuit of Truth. Um, to start his presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, we're on to all of you in advance, and I hope I remember at the end to wish you a Chag um, It's very nice to be here. I, uh, I am by degree a rabbi, and we always like to talk, so you can imagine <laughs> what kind of mood I'm in. Here I am, people listening. Um, <clears throat> Tonight, uh, this evening, uh, there's a wonderful schedule, uh, different aspects of uh, Sukkot and uh, consultation. My particular uh, session deals with the connection, as will the next, uh, in a different, different way, of uh, uh, Kohelet, or the Book of Ecclesiastes, and Sukkot, uh, particularly in my, in my uh, slot in terms of the category of joy. Um, prior to telling what I'll cover, uh, a terminology issue. I will try to be careful and use the word Ecclesiastes for the name of the book. And I will try to use and remember to use Kohelet as the name of the person who speaks 95% of the book. He is a person in the book. Um, if I slip, someone correct me but uh, we will, otherwise it becomes confusing. Um, the association of, um, we'll start with the association of the holiday of Sukkot with the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, from there, we will uh, go to why people suggest in broad terms why the two are connected, leading to the possible connection of happiness in both the text and uh, the holiday of Sukkot. At that point, I will deal a little bit with happiness in Jewish tradition, a little bit with um, <laughs> uh, Kohelet as such, uh, and then uh, happiness or joy uh, in Kohelet and uh, perhaps what one might think about during the holidays. We don't, we probably have too many people to interrupt. Um, I'm not good at looking at chats while I talk. If I end early, and if you have a question, maybe put it in a chat, maybe I'll re, re, you know, relate to it, but I can't promise. Time is short, and there are a lot of people here. So here we go. Ah, I promised another person in, uh, in uh, Schechter Institute to remind or to tell people. There are two things that could fill in beyond tonight's session. One is, of course, to read my book on the on the subject, which is sold through Schechter. It is also sold through Amazon um, book depository and such things. It is called Kohelet's Pursuit of Truth under my name. And if anyone is interested in another aspect of all this, which is reacting to the book of Kohelet, not studying it, but reacting to the claims and life and author of Kohelet, for six weeks, the way the author hoped people would discuss and react, that is going to be a course offered by the Schechter uh, Adult Institute, which if you'll uh, type into Schechter Institute, you'll find under their adult education advertisement. Ah, I should say, please, I have no, <laughs> no royalties and I am teaching the course as a volunteer subject, so it's not a, a self-interest uh, issue. Uh, it's a wonderful book to read. Now, let's go on. So we will do, uh, as I said, the association with 
of, or excuse me, of Ecclesiastes with uh, Sukkot first. Um, in the eighth century of our era, in the book uh, Masecha Sofrim, it is sort of a post-Talmudic, late Talmudic, sort of post-Talmudic uh, text. There's an indication that the five books, which we call scrolls, um, uh, Megillot, uh, are to be read on particular holidays. Some of this is quite obvious. Esther tells the story of Purim. We should read Esther. Um, uh, Lamentations uh, tells of the destruction of the temple belongs on Tisha B'Av. To other kind of fit the seasons, the Song of Songs is highly dealing with nature and a lot of it, not all of it, with early spring, it fits Passover. And um, Ruth all fits the uh, agricultural cycle, the, also possibly her acceptance of Torah or acceptance of um, Jewishness uh, parallel to the acceptance of Torah on Mount Sinai. That leaves one more book, <laughs> the, the book of Ecclesiastes and the holiday of Sukkot, which don't really seem to match. Okay? Why then did it happen? There are many theories, um, and some of them are really beautiful. I have a feeling that if the second session today, you will have in much greater, de greater depth uh, one such view of the connection. But just in a general manner of speaking, uh, as the things that I've learned over the years, one of the theories, teachers at the Jewish Theological Seminary said, well, you only had one left over, <laughs> and you only had one holiday out there, it's a Sukkot, so let's put, let's put it in there. That's, that's one way to do it. Um, there are theories, there are parallels. Um, the Sukkot is not very permanent. The Book of Ecclesiastes kind of says nothing is permanent. It's all hevel, uh, vanity, or fleeting wind, if you will. Um, there's another possible parallel that I deal with today and that both seem to, to dwell upon happiness. The word here is simcha, not other words. And there are, there are theories that there's a counterweight going on here um, that uh, <clears throat> the author of Ecclesiastes is seeking something permanent. And yet on Sukkot, we run out to seek that which is not permanent. We move out to the house which is not. So there are various theories. We tonight will be dealing with um, one possible connection, uh, and that is uh, the, the connection of happiness. I should also note, by the way, that of my scrolls, this is the least read. Most Svardim do not read uh, uh, Ecclesiastes on uh, Sukkot. And even within Svarni Mashkenazi, there are groups in each group that op uh, behave oppositely. It is not read universally on Sukkot. My congregation does. I recommend it to you highly. Okay. Let's now uh, get to, in turn, happiness first in other sources in the Bible. Uh, second, the book of Kohelet, and then happiness in Kohelet, and we'll, we'll see what comes. Uh, happiness is a good name in Judaism. We, it, it's, you know, from, from Hasidic song, songs from Rabbi Nachman, Mitzvah, um, <coughs> uh, it's a great mitzvah to, to live uh, or be, be in so your life. We sing all the time. Every time a holiday comes with some machta v'chagecha, even if it's not from the source of the holiday. Uh, <clears throat> simcha, it, it's a good thing. Simcha, simcha secha, we sang together uh, whenever the cantor said it in the, in the uh, Yom Kippur liturgy. Let's go back, though, not to Hasidic, all the way back to Torah. Where is simcha in the Torah? Now, be careful. I'm not saying happiness in the Bible. There are various words for happiness. There's a very heavy word for happiness called ashray. 
That's mostly in Psalms. And it is a really deep satisfaction, uh, peace with life, uh, complete. That's also called happiness, but that's not. Simcha is closer to cheer, uh, good cheer, good times. Uh, going back to the Torah, three times it's personal. Avimelech says it to Avraham and then says it to uh, Moses. Um, a soldier who's just married doesn't have to go to the army for a year so he can make his wife happy. That's the Simcha, right? Most of the Torah deals with, you might say, sacrifice and holidays. The truth of the matter is, most of those references are to food. The Samachta Bechagecha and the Simcha is mentioned all the time with sacrifices, probably means something like eating meat. <laughs> and you should enjoy yourself. Uh, and a, a good time. Uh, difference of uh, uh, opinion in translations in the Bible. The uh, Jewish translator, JPS, says you should be happy in your holidays, thinking it means you're taking delight in the fact that it's a holiday. But the NRSV, the Revised Standard Version, has better, more exact. He said you should be uh, happy during your holidays. During your holidays, eat meat, <laughs> eat wine. And when you come to Psachim and they deal with the Samachta Bechagecha, they also say it's wine and the, uh, Psachim, uh, uh, part of the Talmud, or uh, it's uh, 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 meat. They also uh, have the possibility of meat. That's what is there back there. We're jumping back now to a part of the Bible in which is really something else. And that is in the book of Kohelet. Clearly, the Torah says the Samachta Bechagecha in relation to Sukkot and one other holiday, but basically it seems to be with Sukkot. Um, and it is a major word in Kohelet, as we shall see. Before we look at where it happens in Kohelet, a few words about the book of Ecclesiastes, about the Ecclesiastes, must be right in our uh, terminology. Ecclesiastes is this scroll. If you have been told or grew up understanding that King Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, um, I don't mean to be ultra critical, but it can't be. The Hebrew of Ecclesiastes is late Hebrew into well into the Second Temple period. Um, no one in Shakespeare's time could write in the 20th century, 21st century English. It doesn't, it can be. So to Solomon could not write the Hebrew of the book of, uh, of Gohelet of Ecclesiastes. Couldn't be. It is a second uh, <coughs> temple book. Uh, it is uh, very clearly influenced by questions that are also being asked in the beginning of Greek philosophy. Uh, that is, I'm not saying it is Greek philosophy. Be careful, okay? It is using the same questions uh, that you find uh, in Greek philosophy. These uh, are the beginning ages of Sism and Ep Epicureanism, um, just like Kohelet, which is the only book in the Bible which concentrates on I, me. I will determine what truth is. I will find it. That is the basis of very different approaches, Stoicism, Epicureanism. And the questions are the same. The answers are not. Absolutely not. And, they, and there is no way to categorize the book of Ecclesiastes as part of Greek philosophy. Doesn't work. People have tried. And when they try, they fail. Trust me, read more of my books if you want. It doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> what is that? Is it a book of philosophy, Jewish philosophy? No, it's even not. A book of philosophy, by its very nature, has to avoid uh, contradictions. 
that would be a poor book of philosophy if I say one thing on one page and 40 pages later say something else, let alone 10 contradictions. It is not a book of philosophy. It is a story, a novel. It is structured very clearly as a novel. Someone introduces the character of Kohelet and summarizes his life at the end. And then you have three sections which trace Kohelet's life. One, Kohelet himself makes up a story about himself. I was once a king. I was the richest person on earth. I knew more than anything on earth or uh, 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 than anyone else on earth. Let me tell you about what I know. Part one, with poems that themselves will prove not clear in the, in the uh, uh, second part of Kohelet, he goes out in the world. He is no longer pretending he's a king. And he now goes through a series of six recorded time experiments. Every one of them says, starts with the word experience and ends, watch with this word, with the word joy. Experience, ending joy. Experience, ending joy. I'm not the only person who says it. There's another guy in France who came up with that theory first. Um, and then at the end, part three, he's approaching death. Very clear, this is a book where he writes something, he experiences life, gives, shares his experience, and then talks about the approaching death. It's almost a, a novel of a biography, a wonderful book. And when you read a biography, change becomes exciting. When somebody changes or contradicts what he said before, then it's a moment of joy. Look, why, how, what's happening, okay? That is the book of Kohelet. Um, it is a, a book full of change. Let me just show you. I'll have to do this quickly because I don't want to run out of time. Let me, take, let me see where we can get here. Watch, uh, I don't see your faces now, but trust. These are items of change in the book of Kohelet, just to illustrate. Uh, I'll give you, I'll run right down. The, the word anguish, that's my translation for Re'ut Ruach. It disappears halfway through the book. I, concentration he has on I, disappears in chapter 12 chapters. You, uh, he's talking more about only starts in four. What advantage? That's what's important for him, but only in the first half of the book. It disappears. Shifts. The heart, for, the heart, which in Bible uh, is the focus of thought more than anything else. Emotion is in the uh, kidneys and the brain doesn't exist. Uh, in the first half, fo focuses on learning, and declaring, and searching. Later, it's on joy. Vapor, which is what other translations call vanity, nothingness. Vapor is literally a breath. You can't hold it. And in time, it disappears before you know it's there. It moves, describes a terrible thing. Along, and then by the end, about pew or uh, vapor, uh, advice moves. First, he says advantages. Then he says, well, you know, it's better to do certain things. And finally, he tells you what to do. Sun changes radically. In the beginning, it's just permanence. Whether it's bad or good, it's, it's there. It keeps coming. Then it's a limited field of vision. He only sees what's under the sun. And finally, it's a source of pleasure, the heat and the absence of death, which is called darkness. Metaphors, which are personal, are almost absent from the first half, apart from the word vapor, and grow exponentially until the end in which they explode all over the book. And start contradictions. In the beginning, it says, I will apply my heart. I'm going to find out what wisdom is. And by the end, towards the second half, he says, you know, I would like to be wise. I can't. I don't know how to be wise. Good heart. In the beginning, he says it comes through anger. In the end, it says it comes through drinking. I'm not making that up. <laughs> Life. First, he says better dead. Then he says, you know what? Is it better even to be stillborn? And, and then later, he says better to be a live dog 
than a dead lion. Women are first more bitter than death, and then experience life with the woman you love. And spirit in the end, he has, in the beginning, he asks in a rhetorical question, if it rises, meaning it doesn't. At the end of the book, the last thing he says, the spirit returns to God who gave it. We'll talk about joy in a second. So it's, it's quite clear. The book is filled with change. If I had to uh, summarize it, it's a man who gets older. He's becoming much more concerned with death. He is less concerned with himself than other people. He is no longer concerned with telling you five facts, <clears throat> but what you should do, do and what might be better than other things. He is uh, interested in metaphor, which is poetry, teaching when you try to teach meaningfully that is absent from the beginning. This is a man who is growing. He's becoming more traditional as he goes along. Please be careful. You'll read my book if you want. I can't say more than this. I'm not saying that the end is better than the beginning. You might read the book of Ecclesiastes and say he became scared of his own conclusions. and He stepped back from being honest. You can say that if you want. Or you can say he grew up and grew wiser. That's for you as the reader to read. And if we go in in course, we will argue out what he might have meant. I'm not saying it changes for better or worse, but change, he does. He grows. He's a different human being. Okay? And all that is background to what we will look at now, and that is joy in Ecclesiastes. Because just like everything else, joy develops. Not quite as much as some other things. I mean, he says, life is horrible. I'd rather be dead. And then he says, there's nothing better than life. Better a live dog than a dead, than a dead lion, right? But um, uh, joy is a much more complex subject. And it is possibly the connection to why this is read on the holiday of Sukkot. Sukkot is the holiday of joy. And now is Kohelet there to tell us what joy is really like? Joy in Ecclesiastes. Um, there's a lot of stuff here. We're not going to do it all. I have a bunch of stars here. The first four all come from the first section of the book, which deals with what his insight as the rich king. All right. In the beginning, you can see. Um, in verses two, one, and two, it doesn't, what is enjoyment? Look at the end, what does it accomplish? There's nothing to it. There's nothing to it. Uh, 2.10, enjoyed everything. And then look at 2.11 right after. It's vapor, it's anguish. There's no advantage, this joy. What it, nah, it doesn't do it. But as he comes toward the end of, even within this first section, within this first section, he sorts of steps back, and we're going to see it again in the second section. Ah, look, he's given wisdom and knowledge and enjoyment to the man who's good in his presence. It's sort of a gift from God. And he'll say in 3.12, still in that summary of what he knows, I know there's nothing better within this than enjoying and acting beneficially in his lifetime. Uh, in, uh, in his lifetime. Any man who consumes and drinks sees benefit it's a gift from god so he's moved even in this first section you have this kind of guy he experimented he included he concluded joy is not worth anything and then sure enough by the sort of saying you know what it's um it's what you got you should maybe do it and then we look through the series of experiences i marked them i just i was my, I'm a little anal, so I put all the joys in here, but we'll just look at the last sentence of the six sections. A, I saw there's nothing better than a man who enjoys it. That's what he's got. Who, uh, we, but, uh, who, who, who knows that? You know, it's a hell of a bit, uh, weak reason, but, you know, eh, take it, take it. B, 
any man whom God gives wealth and power, property, etc., and to enjoy the fruits of his toil, that's a gift, right? Why? 19. For he will not brood much over, uh, much over the days of his life because God keeps him concerned with his heart's enjoyment. Why should he be joyful? It keeps you from thinking about the rest of the stuff. Right? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay. C. We're moving along through the six. You know, he says, on a good die experience, we, we saw before good life and joy or synonym. Bad day, just live with it, you know? But when you get it, you get it. D. He's moving along. He's coming to recommend it. So I commended the joy. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than to eat, drink, be joyful. That that can stay with you while you were. He's already recommending the stuff. And on the fifth, go and look at this section is too long to read all at once, but look at it briefly on your screen. Go eat, drink, white clothes, get married, enjoy. You know, that's what you have. That's what you can do. Go go for this joy. And you kind of wonder in, in this book, which so dwells on how nothing is worthwhile, how big is this? It's it's like the, the small counterweight or big counterweight. Hmm. And F, 11, 7, which is the end of the sixth, even if a man goes as many take joy in it, do it. Well, remember the days of darkness, which will be because after this, there's nothing else. And then in the beginning of the final thing on death, the very first thing he says, take joy, O youth, in your earliest days. Let your heart be good to you in the days of your youth and walk in the, in the paths of what your eyes can see. God's going to judge you. Right? All right. This is, I, I'm, I have to leave it to you. Is this a big recommendation for joy? Um, does it appeal? Does is this what they meant? Is it this a joy, perhaps a counter to the joy of Sukkot? And if you're getting drunk on Simchat Torah, hey guys, this is this is take it easy, have for the moment, but it's it's not really um, uh, the uh, the end uh, all be all of all. Uh, of all that uh, that that you have, I don't think I have time. Who's the French? I didn't. Re did I refer to a French philosopher? Someone asked. French philosopher. No, I think you just mentioned the, a, a book of philosophy uh, and why Kohelet is not a book of philosophy, right? Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Same I do on joy. That, nobody has a, a Kohel's idea on joy. If that was a question, or so that or there was a question there. Nobody has Kohel's idea on joy. It is so unique. Um, I'm looking quick at the uh, uh, who wrote Ecclesiastes. We don't know. Someone asked. Um, we don't know. Uh, and those seem to be the messages, unless I missed some. I think that's it. Um, let me let me just end illustrating to you what we're going to do when we come to joy in, in this in this discussion class. There's one my book on Kohelet. I believe that Kohelet just begs for huge numbers of reactions. So unlike all of my other biblical commentaries, I have a whole section in the end of modern poetry and prose which reacts to Kohelet. Um, bad, good, uh, et cetera, and so forth. And I even list questions. Would Kohelet have written what he did if he were married, if he had children, et cetera? That's for the course, if, if anyone wants to take that discussion course. But um, <clears throat> one of the most impressive pieces at the back is by Rabbi Karlbach. This is Yosef Tzvi Karlbach. I won't quote it because I'll run over time. Who dies in the Shoah? He dies in the uh, Holocaust. All right. 
and he writes this praise of Kohelet, in which he says, basically, every time I'm depressed, I read Kohelet, and I learn again that I'm not alone in suffering and in seeing all the bad in the world. And Kohelet teaches me that I must seize joy when I can. I, I almost cry when I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I read this stuff. It is, it is the most complex and moving testimony to joy and Kohelet I know. It is worthwhile. I, if you can read my book, read my book. If you don't read the, read the book of Kohelet. Remember, it's a biography. If you take the conversation course, I promise you, no one will be told who's right or wrong. We're going to react to what Kohelet says. But it is a wonderful, I, I think one of the greatest gifts we have with the holidays is that someone, for some reason, whatever it was, said to us, when you're Samatha Bechagecha, take the time, take the time. Saturday afternoon, take the book, read it, and think about it, confront it, confront this incredibly complex man who could say, be joyful in a way that is different than probably anything we thought about before. I apologize we couldn't exchange. I never teach like this, but that is the nature of a, uh, a large attendance at a group. And I do apologize to all of you. Chag Sameach. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Benjamin. I will say that for me, for sure, reading the Book of Kohelet in the upcoming holiday will be different now after hearing um, some of uh, the stories and uh, your commentary on it. Thank you very, very much. Um, and we'll be moving on to uh, Rabbi Mimi. Um, can we see you, Rabbi Mimi? I'm here on my screen. I'm right next to you. <laughs> right here you are. Um, so uh, just before we'll start, um, I will just say that I am in the messages in the chat. I am just uploading um, this uh, document with um, all the um, resources for Rabbi Mimi's class. So you can open. She doesn't want everyone. She wants everyone to see as much uh, of each other as possible. So you could just um, look into it and open it up and um, and read it uh, in your on your computer while uh, Rabbi Mimi uh, is speaking. And I'll just say one more word that uh, uh, Rabbi Mimi Begelton, if you don't know her, she's a doctor and she's a, a, a spiritual influencer, Mashpia Ruchanit, and a senior lecturer at the Shechter Rabbinical Seminary. Uh, Rabbi Mimi, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And... Um... Since I do see so many uh, familiar names and faces, I'm going to start where we always start together. Um, you know, and you go in an opening prayer, and then we'll go into some text study. <laughs> I can read lips, so I see if you're singing with me or not. Malka de Alma, Ima Ila, one and only fine mother. What a miracle that you give us an opportunity to come so close to understanding what it is to make a miracle happen, what it is to make yesh me'ayim. A moment ago, we had a space that seemed no space. 
now all of a sudden we have our dwelling, our home for the next seven days. What a miracle. What a miracle that is. And thank you for giving us this opportunity to experience it. And then the miracle of being able to be in each of us in our own homes and at the same time come together in the merit of learning Torah together, to have this merit and this blessing of sitting and learning together. I'm grateful for all of them. And I'm grateful for Machon Shechter for organizing this opportunity to stop from the building, from the cooking, from the shopping, from the preparing, from the Arabaminim, to actually take a few minutes to sit, to learn, to think. I want to uh, borrow um, or claim one word that came up m- multiple times in our learning um, right now with Rabbi Benji Siegel, and that's the word metaphor. Because what I'd like to do through looking at the Hasidic sources that I brought, to think of the sukkah as a metaphor. And specifically in these Hasidic teachings, um, a metaphor for our relationship with, with God. I want us to look at the sukkah as a metaphor for our relationship with God. And the truth is that I find it, and I don't know about you, but there's a part of me that's very grateful for the proximity of, of Sukkot to, to Yom Kippur. Because the question really is, how do we walk away from Yom Kippur? On Yom Kippur, we were, we were, we were cloistered. We were all together in community and so focused on our prayer and our family, our community, the future, what's going to be, how is it going to be? The um, machzor with thousands of words telling us what to think, what to feel, how to be. And how do we walk away from it? Like, lahavdi, lahavdi. Like, I mean, get it from Shiva. How do we get up from Shiva? Right? We know that we don't get up from Shiva. We're raised from Shiva. Someone literally pulls us up. So here as well, I want to say, how do we walk away from Yom Kippur and into the world, into our, all these promises and commitments that we have made for ourselves and towards the one and only? I think that we actually get one taste of it, should be told, when we're actually still in Bitkinesa, still praying. For those of us that stay and actually um, stay for the Tfilat Arvit, for me, that's the first step oh, out of Yom Kippur. Um, I will confess, um, I'm, I, maybe I'm dating myself, I'm clearly dating myself. There is a way in which I feel that Hashem Wa Elohim seven times is similar to what happens in Get Smart. Remember? At the end of Get Smart, there is one, one, one gate that goes down and another gate that goes down and another and another and another. And I always feel that as a saying, seven times Hashem Elohim, there's this, some kind of closure that's happening. Thank God the Mayor um, Parmeshlan says we're locked, it's Ni'ila, we're locked. I'm a locking, but we're locked in, not locked out. As a child, I thought we were locked out, and I was devastated when Ela came to an end. I thought, oh my God, now what happens? But his teaching tells me locked in, the gate is locked behind. Nonetheless, that moment of Kriyat Shema, of Arvit, that's my first step out of Yom Kippur. Because a minute ago, I was screaming at the top of my lungs, honestly, Baruch Shem Kol Machuto Leolam Va'et three times. And then all of a sudden, the Shema of Arvit, of, Yom, of Motzei Yom Kippur, and all of a sudden, I'm back to whispering, oh, I can't say it out loud. I'm no longer on the inside. Can you mean? How do we, sorry, how do we, I want to say that's the first step, but then how do we walk into the world? And we also know that there are 70 days from Yom Kippur until Hanukkah. 70 days, like a lifetime. 70 days that we move from a sukkah, which is our dirat aray, to ish ubeto, our home. 70 days to make the transition. The Pasuk that I want us to look at, and the Mashi Loch looks at it, and if you look at the resource sheet, you'll see that I actually, and I don't do this often, I actually don't remember the last time I did this, to bring the father, the son, and the grandson together. I I seldomly actually do this in terms of looking at a Mashi Loch and the Beit Yaakov, his son, and the Sod Yisharim, his grandson. 
But this is the core question. And the, they base it on a pasuk, which seems to be such a random pasuk and an insignificant pasuk. And when thinking about Sukkot, this is not the pasuk that we normally go to. So this pasuk appears right after Yaakov and Esav part ways. We're in Parashat Vaishlach. And Esav goes on his way, and Yaakov goes on his way. And we're told that he builds a home for himself. He builds a sukkah for his cattle, his mikneh. And he names the location based on the dwelling that he made for his cattle, which makes no sense whatsoever. And that is the core question that the Mashi law, Rishwit Rebbe, starts out with. Out of all the, of, after this amazing encounter with Esav, it's hard to imagine why Yaakov would name the location of his next stop based on based on the uh, based on the cattle, what is considered to be tafel, secondary. And Micha, there's a request again for the um, source sheets to be posted. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's in the chat. I'm, I'm going to post it again. Achem, and he says the following. I'm going to read only a few lines. You see some of it's highlighted in bold and underlined, and some of it, so only we'll look at a few of the sentences in each one. Lavin lama kara shem hamakom hashem hamikne shu tafel velo al shmo shu haikar. To be Bet Yaakov. That's what the maybe location should be called. Why Sukkot? A home is our protection to the point that we don't actually know what's happening outside. We're protected and we're somewhat secluded. I want to say again, I want to hold on to Sukkot Chanukah because Chanukah is Ishu Beito, but the candles are lit actually at the entrance. At the, at the opening. There's a way in which Dafka, the candles there are asking, asking us, on the one hand, we're defined by our home. On the other hand, there has to be access to the outside world. And that is going to be here the question, because I could also say that on young people, we're also, we're, we're, we're really, in some way, we're cut off from the world. We're 25 hours very much deeply into our prayer, deeply into our kavanot, deeply into our fasting, deeply into our yearnings for the year to come. And so there's a way in which what's happening outside in the world, not so clear. And especially I want to say those who, who spent Yom Kippur in their home and were at prayers, at pilot, only through Zoom, also, even more so, closed in, clustered. So here's our metaphor. Our home, our bait. Like the Mishnah says, know where we come from, where we come from and where we're going. He says, that's our sense of security. Our home, our tribe, our family, our community. We're all the children of Aram Yitzchak Yaakov, Sarah Yitzchak Yaakov, Sarah Yitzchak And that doesn't change. We don't need to do anything. We're born into that. Right? Or those of us who later in life make that choice to become part of the Jewish people. And once you become part of the Jewish people, then there's nothing to do. That is a commitment, a devotion. I want to say a commitment of God to us. That doesn't change, regardless of our actions. The Yaakov, I'm skipping down a bunch of lines. The Yaakov, Avinu, lo batach al-schut avot. Ragzeh haya lo shalom idat. Yaakov, he encounters Esav, and then he goes on his way, and he says, but who am I? And what can I rely on? And who can I rely on? That's the question when we go out into the... Yom Kippur, with community, with our teachings, with our rabbis, with our congregants, with our students. Now what? Now where? And now with who? So Yaakov has this question within himself. What can he rely on? 
And therefore, the mikne asa sukkot, the word mikne is connected to the word kinyan, what he acquired. I want to say it's not, it's not our genetics, but it's what we've done with our lives, what we've claimed for ourselves, the identity of what, we have, what we've claimed with our actions. For Yaakov, it wasn't about the family he was born into. It wasn't about that promise that God promises him because of his heritage. Yaakov wants to know what belongs to him by virtue of his own actions, his own fortitude, his own conviction. And therefore he says, who I am, you know, the Midrash says, the Midrash in Brashit Rabbah says that we have multiple names, and one is the name that we, our parents give us when we come into the world. Another is the name that others call us. And the third is the name that we acquire for ourselves through our actions. So here the sukkah begins to be this metaphor of my actions. And temporary actions, actions that that surround us for seven days, true, but nonetheless, but they're actions that take the infinite and actually give it a form and shape. You know, my neighbor wasn't too happy uh, with me because I put up a sukkah, I put up a sukkah, Boaz, Shachat, God bless him, came to my home and he put up my sukkah um, in a parking spot. Now, I contacted the neighbor whose parking spot I was using, who was like more than happy and gracious about using their parking spot to put up the sukkah. And this other neighbor, she pulls in and she says, 30 years, and there's never been a sukkah here ever. And I smiled and I said, well, welcome. You're welcome to, to enjoy the sukkah now. And I didn't want to tell her, you know, when I signed the lease two and a half years ago, I already saw my sukkah exactly in the, where it is. How could you not see my sukkah being there for the last two and a half years? Oh, because all you could see was your neighbor's parking spot. But when I looked at my neighbor's parking spot, I saw a sukkah. So the sukkah is a metaphor for our actions. The sukkah is a metaphor for walking in God's footsteps by virtue of being able to turn something from nothing, me'ayin, to yish. And I want to say that it's the sitra achra, it's the yatara that tells us if it's not going to last, then it's not worth anything. You know, without being too personal, because but you always know that I am personal. About 30 years ago, I was given a gift to go to some health, health boot camp for a month to, to shed some weight. And I remember uh, my chavrut at the time, he said to me, well, what's the point? You're going to go for a month and then you're going to come back and you'll be the same. And I said to him, you know, I'd like to believe that after 30 days, I'd like to believe that I'll learn enough to make a difference in my life. And if not, at least I know that I experienced other. At least I know that for 30 days, I experienced other. And the sukkah gives us an opportunity to experience other. And to start with that, to start with knowing that I can't maybe make major promises. And I wanna say, the long list of the Ashamnu Bagadnu, thank you very much, and the long list of the Achet, I pray that we, you also took time to do the opposite. Ahavti, biliti, for each one in the positive. What did we do positive this past year? Not only do we want to transgress. So that's the Mashiach. He, he formulates the question of why the temporary, why naming after the temporary? Yaakov making a statement that after the temporary is ours, is what we claim, and therefore it's not secondary, it's the essence. The Beit Yaakov, his son, will continue in that way and say, and therefore it's, it's temporary, it doesn't, it doesn't have sustainability, and why would we create this kind of structure? And then he says, 
‫שאלה הגורל השם שזה רומז, ‫שהשם חפץ בישראל, ‫בהערתו אותם. ‫אבל אם אתם, God loves us. ‫זה הסקרט. ‫הסקרט באמת הוא שאתם אוהבים אותנו, ‫לא משנה מה שאתם עושים. ‫כלומר, כמובן, ‫כמובן, כמובן, ‫אנחנו אוהבים את הסטודנטים, ‫אנחנו אוהבים את הילדים. And there's something intrinsic to, to that relationship that is irrelevant, actions are irrelevant. Deeds are rele they're important, I'm not saying not. But there's something that we know inside of ourselves that no matter what, there's a part of my love, my soul children, that will never be blemished, no matter what happens or doesn't happen. And he says the nations, the nations, they're jealous. And that can evoke judgment. Why does God love them so much, regardless of their actions? So we're told, mitzvah kala. Something simple. It doesn't have to last forever. You know, a seven-day crash diet. You don't have to change for, for life. Something. Make a mark in the world. Do something in the world. Try it. That's what the sukkah is. Temporary? Sure. Forever? No. But I want you to know, I don't know about you, but when I walk into my sukkah, I can't believe, I, I can't believe that it wasn't there an hour ago. I, I can't believe that I didn't have this amazing dwelling an hour ago. And it doesn't matter that in seven days it's going to go back to being a parking spot. Right now, it's all surrounded by God's love. So taken in by this possibility of creating something that literally was non-existent. There was like a pile of beams and a piece of material folded up and some dead branches. And now I'm majorly in love with my sukkah. I didn't want to leave it this evening to go home, to come into the house to learn. I, I'm like, I can't wait. I can't wait to be here. In the moment, what we have is the moment. And I want you to know the people that we're so close with, so intimate with, the truth of the matter is that we know what that feels like. We don't have to have a make a conversation with them. We don't have to make plans for our future. Sitting with them for a moment fills our heart. And that is the essence of who we are, is being able to take those moments, to take those moments. And the Sot Yisharim, the Meshulot's grandson, the Bet Yaakov's son. So he, God bless him, in his Sot Yisharim, he has a whole book that is dedicated to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. A whole book of teachings. God created a world of Chesed. And when God, Hainu, ki ha-chesed ha-rishon, sh'aya ba-etchalat ha-briya, lo aya bo shum itarud ha-dilatata, v'mikhazdo, itbarak, sh'chafetz le-tziv le-briyo. When God created the world, it came from a place of God's ultimate love and kindness. It wasn't dependent on our actions. We didn't have to, we didn't, we, we didn't exist. We didn't exist yet. So, all, all of creation comes from a place of benevolence. And then what do we do in order to go from back to that moment? Can we come back to that moment? And the Sodhi Shalim says the time of Sukkot is the time of the Asif. It's the time of the harvesting. We, we bring our harvest back into our home. And for a moment, we have a sense that it's actually our actions. It's our work. It's what we've succeeded in doing in our lifetime. So therefore... We have the sukkah. You think you're bringing it into your home? Really? You're bringing it into your sukkah. You think that it's really all about your abilities? And it's your toil? Actually, there's a partnership happening here. Yes, you have that ability. But in our capacity as human beings, God is eternal. God's work is eternal. God's creation is eternal. And ours, how do we negotiate and how do we live with the temporary? But how can we not only live with the contemporary, the, 
the temporary, this non-permanence, how do we value the non-permanence? What is it about us that thinks that if something is not permanent, that it has no value or it's compromised in its value? What happened to the Torah of the moment? Can we embrace that? Right, for me, it's always um, Pesach, right? 18 minutes, Matzah. 18 minutes and one second, Hametz. So there we know what the, what the value and the power of one second is. We have it here as well. The ability to have a moment where we experience God's closeness and God's intimacy. Is that enough? When I was a child, I thought that when we davened, we had to have kavanah from the first word that we, when we opened the sidul or opened the mahzol until the last word. And then the Hasidic Rebbe's, Rabbi Avraham Kolitz, Rabbi Nachman Davitebs, they taught me, maybe actually out of all the tefillah, it's one sentence. Maybe actually of the whole tefillah, it's one word. I like to think of the sukkah as well as that metaphor for that one word. Not the whole book. It's not the whole nusach. One word that I can walk with in the world from Yom Kippur. And one word today. And what's the word tomorrow going to be? I want to end with a teaching from the Mashi Loch, which is one of my favorite, favorite teachings on the Pasuk Kilon Achash Biyakov Elo Kesem Biyisrael. Because if you remember, the Beit Yaakov, he said, we make the sukkah because what are the nations going to say when they see this unconditional love? That there's a wisdom that Bil'am has to understand how we walk in the world in our relationship with God. Nachash, nechishut, nek, nechishut, is determination. Yaakov is used as an understanding of consciousness, of contracted consciousness. Yaakov, Yud Ekev, like our heel. We want to talk about our contracted consciousness in God's presence, we use the name Yaakov. We want to talk about expansive consciousness, Israel, Lirosh. And you know Yaakov Avinu is the one that his name continues to change. In the same pasuk, look at Bereshit Memtet. You'll see in the same pasuk, Yaakov and Israel. It's not that he graduated from contracted consciousness into expanded consciousness and has an understanding and a vision that he didn't have before. We go in and out, in and out of experience, in and out of perception, in and out of moments of being in God's presence and feeling so far from God. In and out of having a moment of knowing what God wants of us, having an inside, I want to say conviction, an epiphany, moment of prophecy, we have a sense of clarity, what God wants of us in this moment, and then sometimes we walk around for days, for weeks. Michal, would you please stop playing with your hair? It's very discerning. I'm sorry. He, I didn't hear what you said, but something I'm doing is um, uncomfortable for you. When we are in a state of Yaakov, of contracted consciousness, we don't hold on to it. We don't hold on to it and insist and persist. On the other hand, when we have clarity as to what it is we're meant to be doing, we don't wait for it to happen by itself. We actually go out into the world and make it happen. And then, the gift that we have is that we know, identify when it is that we need to hold back and wait and let things happen by themselves. And when it is that we know to create a reality. And again, the sukkah, on the one hand, 
gives us both of these abilities. It tells us when we come out of Yom Kippur, there's something to do. There's something that we need to act upon. We need to create a holy space from what seems to be no space. And on the other hand, yes, how long do I hold on to it? Seven days. How long am I meant to hold on to it? What's going to happen in those 70 days from Sukkot to Hanukkah? What are the things that I know that they're going to be completely temporary, not permanent, only a sukkah? And what of all of those promises, commitments, devotion, yearnings, longings, and moments of Yom Kippur are we going to actually hold on to as a bite and bring them first into our sukkah, experience them, and then to say, this I'm holding on to, this I'm taking with me, from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur to Sukkot into Hanukkah. And these are here for the moment. And they're going to hold me for seven days. And I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to say, Hodul Adonai Kito, Kito Olam Chasto. And then I'm going to continue on. It blesses us to be able to make those distinctions in our life, in our heart, in our soul, in our being, in our relationship with God, between our permanent and our impermanent and that we can share those impermanent moments as well as our permanent moments. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Mimi. I think it was very inspiring um, and uh, just to experience this design. I'm sure that uh, all of us um, are going to take in that experience. Um, I want to move uh, on forward to Gila. Hi, good evening. Or Good afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs> Hi, Gila. Thank you for joining us. Um, Gila um, Bachman. Um, she is a doctor uh, for the um, uh, um, Schechter Institute and the Schechter Rabbinical Seminary. Um, and um, uh, she, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you'll enjoy her lecture about the Sukkah with Rabbi Eliezer, Halacha, and Agada. Thank you very much, Michal. And again, hello to everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen, unlike the previous speakers. I hope it works OK for everybody. Um, so the main, um, my learning will focus on uh, a most unusual rabbi um, and his special connection to the festival of Sukkot. And of course, this is Rabbi Eliezer, in his full name, Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkenut. Um, and he was one of the most important uh, Tanaim, sages, sages of the Mishnah. Uh, he was a student of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. Um, some of you might know the stories about how um, he took part in um, uh, saving him and um, getting him out of Yerushalayim uh, during the destruction. Um, and he was the teacher of Rabbi Akiva. So this puts him in a very central um, place. And according to the Talmudic stories, he started studying at a late age, uh, 28 probably, and left a life of wealth to learn Torah at Rabbi Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai's Bet Midrash in Jerusalem. Um, he established a yeshiva in Lod. Um, so in the next 20 something minutes, or so, uh, we will look at his sayings and read some stories about him from the Mishnah, the Tosefta, the Midrash, and the Talmud. And we will examine some of the machlokot, the disputes uh, regarding the Sukkah, in which he presents a single opinion against the opinion of the rabbis, of the sages. And we will try to understand what approach does he represent and how do the stories about him relate to his halachic approach. This is a unique combination of agada and halacha, and they seem to affect each other. Um, most of them will be found in the Talmud. Um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to bring them from several sources. I see that I am asked to um, enlarge the slideshow. It's not big enough. 
Um, I'll do my best, but I also um, I'm trying to do it also convenient for me. So um, maybe you can enlarge your own um, screen or something like that. If you click on the presentation button, then it will fill the uh, screen. Yes, but then I, I hope I can move. I usually have problems with that. Oh, no, if, you're fine. You're fine. People okay. can do it from home. Okay. I'll, I'll try this way. And if it doesn't work, I go back to the other um, way. Okay. So the first source that we see here, I hope you all see it. Um, this is from the Mishnah. Mishnah uh, Masechet Sukkah, Perek Bet Mishnah Vav. And here is the first machloket, the first um, dispute. So Rabbi Eliezer says, a person is obligated to eat 14 meals in the sukkah, one during the day and one at night. Of course, this refers to all seven days. That's how we got to 14 meals. And the rabbis say there is no quota for this matter except for the meal on the evening of the first festival. So, first of all, we have to have in mind that in the time of the sages, in the time of the Mishnah, the custom was to have two meals a day, not three meals as we, we might think of it. Um, so, Rabbi Eliezer here um, represents a maximalist or demanding approach, which requires the person to have two meals a day every day, even on Chol HaMued. Okay. Um, on the other hand, the rabbis require only one as a mandatory meal, probably like Leila said, the, the, the meal of Pesach. The Gemara um, eventually um, learns this from Pesach. But uh, nevertheless, all the other meals depend on the will of the person. It isn't mentioned explicitly, but I would assume that also the three meals of Shabbat should be eaten in the sukkah because they are also um, mandatory. But we see a dispute, a machloket here, about how many meals a person should eat in the sukkah. Now, this um, is discussed in the Talmud. The Talmud, Bavli, Masechet Sukkah, Daf Zayin, Amud Aleph, tries to understand what is the reason for each side in this machloket. So the Gemara, the Talmud asks, what is the rational or what is the reason for the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer? And they say he learns it from the verse, Besukot Teshvu Shivat Yamin. You can see the verse uh, at the bottom of, um, uh, of the PowerPoint, right? Um, so the word Teshvu, okay, in Sukkot you shall reside. Um, reside as you dwell in your permanent home. Okay, the word permanent and the word temporary, which also uh, appeared in the previous uh, shiur with Rob Mimi, uh, will appear again here. Um, this comes from the idea of a permanent uh, dwelling. So um, therefore, just as in one's dwelling, one eats one meal during the day and one meal at night, so too in the sukkah, one meal should be eaten during the day and one at night. That's the explanation of Rabbi Eliezer. What about the rabbis? Well, they say they also use the word kedira as uh, a permanent dwelling. A sukkah is like a permanent dwelling, just as in one's dwelling, if one desires to eat, eat and if one does not desire to, to do so, he does not eat. So too in, a, in the sukkah. If one desires to eat, he eats, and if not, he does not eat. So as we can see, uh, basically, um, both Rabbi Eliezer and Chachamim rely on the same verse, the verse, Basukot Teshuvu Shivat Yamim. Only each side perceives the concept of Taduru, Teshuvu Ke'en Taduru, that you should reside in a different way. For Rabbi Eliezer, the dwelling in the Sukkah is total both day and night, and therefore he requires 14 meals. For the sages, residing in the sukkah is an expression of freedom and independence. A person is to behave naturally and feel at home, as we say, in the sukkah. So if you want, you can eat. If you don't want, you don't have to. That's the first machloket, uh, the first dispute, and it's reasoning or it's rational. 
Now we come for no, to another machloket, and this one comes from uh, a breita, a Tanaitic source, but it doesn't appear in the Mishnah. It, the, the Talmud brings it. And it says, Tanya, uh, which means this is a breita. Rabbi Eliezer says, one may not depart from one sukkah to another, to another sukkah, and one may not build a sukkah during Chol HaMoed. Even if you did not have a chance to build the sukkah beforehand, you should not build a sukkah um, during Chol HaMoed. And the rabbi said, one may depart from one sukkah to another sukkah, and one may build a sukkah on Chol HaMoed. Again, the Talmud asks, what's the reason, um, what's the logic behind these things? I think I skipped it, oh, here it is. Um, where is the rational of Rabbi Eliezer? Because the verse says, you shall prepare for yourself you should prepare for yourself the festival of Sukkot for seven days. Establish a Sukkah that is suitable for seven days. You cannot build it during Chol HaMoed. It should be built for seven days. It should last seven days. Um, and what do the rabbis say? How do the rabbis interpret this verse? This is what the Torah says, establish sukkah during the festival. So again, both sides refer to the same pasuk, only they understand a bit different, in a bit different way. Um, I'm just gonna change the, no, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop here for a minute. I hope you're still with me. Um, just a second. This is a chance for everybody to wake up if you fell asleep. Um, so we see another machloket, another dispute, saying that um, there are two different opinions of how to look at the building of the sukkah. Notice that the reasoning, the, the, the rational that the Talmud gives um, does not refer to the first part. The Talmud does not discuss the reason for why not to leave from one sukkah to the other. But I think we're going to get the explanation for this um, using the next uh, source, which is um, a Midrash, the Midrash on the book of Deuteronomy, Sifrei Dvarim. And here in the Midrash, um, regarding the verse, Hag HaSukkot Ta'aselecha Shivat Yamim, we actually saw this verse in the Braita. Um, before. So Rabbi Eliezer says, he's, here's another machloket um, between the sides. Rabbi Eliezer says, just as one does not fulfill his obligation on the first day of the festival with his neighbor's lulav, you know that each, each and everyone has to have or use a lulav um, to themselves, uh, say the blessing on the lulav, so he does not fulfill it with his neighbor's sukkah. It's being written, shall you make for yourself. Chag ha-sukot lecha. You are supposed to make the sukkah for yourself. And the rabbis say, he does not fulfill his obligation with his neighbor's lulav. That is true. It being written, and you shall take you on the first day, the fruit of goodly trees, uh, branches of palm trees. Uh, you, I hope you know this. Lachem lachem. So, lachem. You should take um, to each for each individual, but he does fulfill his obligation with his neighbor's sukkah. It being written, every native in Israel shall dwell in Sukkot. All of Israel may dwell in one sukkah. This is a very main idea in the idea that all, uh, all our people are well, they deserve or they may dwell in one sukkah. Technically, quite a problem. But I, um, the reason that the rabbis learned this idea comes from the word sukkot. You can see that the word sukkot is one sukkah, not any. So again, we see the different way um, of Rabbi Eliezer and the rabbis to read the
as during the Chag. Um, luckily, the Halakha is not according to Rabbi Eliezer, and I'm going to discuss this um, in the continuation of my um, view. So here we see another machloket, um, another dispute um, regarding, and I think you can start to see that there's something um, that consistent about the way Rabbi Eliezer looks at the sukkah and what he demands of a person in order to fulfill the mitzvah of sukkot. Okay, so um, another uh, Tanaitic source uh, comes from the Tosefta, the Tosefta, uh, which is um, it's, uh, constructed very much, arranged very much like the Mishnah, and also in the Tosefta in Masechet Sukkah in the second chapter, we find um, this very interesting source. It's not, a, this time it is not a machloket, it is not a dispute between Rabbi Eliezer and Chachamim, but we find um, Rabbi Eliezer's opinion in it. So the Tosefta says, those out on a mission of mitzvah, shluchei mitzvah, are exempt from Sukkah, from uh, the mitzvah of Sukkah. They don't, do not have to build a sukkah if they're uh, on the road. However, it is prays for a man to leave his house during the festival. They're allowed to not having a sukkah, but it's not a good thing to have only if it's necessary. And then the Tosefta tells us a story. There's a story of Rabbi Eli who went to visit Rabbi Eliezer in Lud. I remind you that um, Rabbi Eliezer established the yeshiva in Lud. So this um, this story tells us about his, probably his principal, his um, pupil, um, that came to visit him, um, probably during the festival. And Rabbi Eliezer said to him, what does this mean, Eli? Are you not one of those who rest on the festival? It's a very not nice welcome, uh, welcoming of your um, disciple, right? What are you doing here are you not you're supposed to be resting now in your home and not come to visit me is it not said it is no praise for a man to leave his house during the festival since it is said you shall rejoice okay here we connect to the first um fuel the first lecture you shall rejoice in your festival with your son and daughter you probably know this uh pasuk, right uh the samachta bechagecha um, so uh, I see a question here is that Tosefta talking about building a sukkah or dwelling in a sukkah. True. Um, this, this source does not mention a sukkah. It only mentions a home. You should not leave your home. But we see, first of all, it comes from a sechet sukkah. So we might assume that it, it it talks about the sukkah and also the sukkah, the tzamachta bechagecha, we know, um, uh, talks about sukkot. So it doesn't mention anything about building or not building a sukkah. It says that shluchai mitzvah p'turi mina sukkah. They don't have to, um, they are exempt from the mitzvah of sukkah. They don't have to eat or sleep in the sukkah. Obviously, they're on the way. They can't do it. But what is more interesting is the story here because the story um, emphasizes that Rabbi Eliezer is against leaving your home, or as we saw in the previous source, leaving your sukkah, even if it's for some kind of mitzvah. Rabbi Eli might even be a shliach mitzvah, visiting his rabbi. We know that there's um, there's a I've been disconnected for a minute. I'm sorry for this. Um, so the next um, source is actually a story, a very famous story in the Talmud. The Talmud brings this story um, sort of right after uh, what we read, the discussion about leaving um, 
a sukkah during the festival. And this story tells us um, about Rabbi Eliezer. Once Rabbi Eliezer stayed in the sukkah of Rabbi Yochanan, son of Rabbi Eli, in Caesarea, in Caesarea, in Caesarea. This is probably the same Eli that we met before, his disciple. Now this is his son, Rabbi Yochanan, in which sukkah Rabbi Eliezer. And the sun was approaching, probably the day is becoming more, more and more hot. Rabbi Yochanan said, may I spread a sheet over it to cover it, to, to make some shade? Rabbi Eliezer said, there is no tribe of Israel from which a judge did not emerge. It's very hard to see the connection between his answer and the question. It has nothing to do, no relation whatsoever. Strange, but the story continues. In the meantime, the sun reached the midpoint of the tzuka. The sun keeps on going. Uh, time passes. Um, Rabbi Yochanan said, may I spread a sheet over it? It becomes more and more uh, important to, to do it. Rabbi Eliezer said to him, there is no tribe of Israel from which prophets did not emerge. And the tribes of Judah and Benjamin established kings according to prophets. Again, he answers, his answer has no uh, connection to the question. Um, Yochanan, I'm sorry, at that point, the sun reached the feet of Rabbi Eliezer. It's getting really close. In a minute, he's going to be sitting in the hot sun. Anybody uh, who sits in the sukkah in Israel during September knows it can turn really hot and unpleasant. Um, and that's what Rabbi Yochanan obviously is afraid of. Um, so Rabbi Yochanan the sheet and spread it over the sukkah. Rabbi Eliezer slung his cloak behind him and left the sukkah. Not because he was diverting his attention with his words. I think this means that Rabbi Eliezer was diverting, saying things that have not no connection, but because he never said a matter that he did not hear from his teacher. And this is the point of this story. It's a very, very puzzling story. And um, the, the behavior of Rabbi Eliezer in the story is very puzzling. Why does he not respond? What is the meaning of his sermon, of his Dvar Torah? What is he saying here about the tribes? Why, why does it have to do um, with the situation? And um, I would love to hear ideas. If anybody have, you can write in the chat. What, what do you think is the connection between speaking about the judges and the prophets and the kings? What does it have to do with sitting in the sukkah? But this way or the other, without getting into this very um, complicated question, it is clear that Rabbi Eliezer avoids, purposely avoids answering Rabbi Yochanan and expects him to understand the idea by himself. He forbids to spread the sheet. Otherwise, he would act differently. So why does he not say it explicitly? According to the Talmud, and this is probably an addition, it's not an uh, imminent part of the story, the last um, sentence, is that he never heard this answer from his rabbi, and therefore he could not say it explicitly. And this is the very main part of his character. And we're going to see it in other sources. I think the next source even says it uh, stronger. Um, first of all, we have to say that Talmud asks, uh, and we, we probably all asked ourselves, didn't he just say that you're not allowed to sit in some other person's sukkah during the sukkot? You should not leave your own sukkah. Uh, that's the, what Talmud asks. How did Rabbi Eliezer do so? Didn't he himself say one may not depart from one sukkah to another sukkah? So what is he doing in Kesalia, right? Well, they say the incident was in a different festival. This was not a sukkah for a mitzvah. This was just a sukkah for um, sitting in the shade. Um, okay, so this is a different festival, but still, remember the story with Eli? He said, I praise the lazy. This is the word the Gemara uses, lazy, who do not leave their houses on the festival. And then they say, okay, it wasn't a festival, it was Shabbat. So the whole question here is not a question of sukkah, it's a question of Shabbat. This is one way of looking at it, but I think a different way of looking at it is as the character of Rabbi Eliezer. And here's another story, and this one 
has to be in Sukkot. Maaseh de Rabbi Eliezer, once Rabbi Eliezer stayed in the upper Galilee and the people there asked him 30 halachot in the halachot of Sukkah. So this is really a question of Sukkah. In response to 12, he said, I heard an answer. In response to the other 18, he said, I did not hear an answer. He refuses the answer because he never heard an answer for these questions. So they asked him, the people, are all the matters that you know only from what you heard? He said to them, now you forced me to say a matter that I did not hear from my teachers. And this is the thing he said. In all my days, no person ever preceded me into the study hall, the Kamidrash, and I never slept in the study hall, neither substantial sleep or a brief nap. Notice that in Hebrew it says, Lo sheinat keva, velo sheinat arai. Here are the words permanent and temporary, um, which repeat a lot, many times in these um, discussions in the Talmud. And I never left anyone in the study hall and ex exited. And I never engaged in idle conversation, and I never said anything that I did not hear from my teacher. And this is the main idea of Rabbi Eliezer, in my opinion. Um, I'm just looking at the question here. Am I correct that you can also do not leave your home to eat a fikoman, right? Um, a very similar halakha about Pesach, about a fikoman, you must not leave one chavura, one group of people. Uh, in order to eat the Pesach, the Korban itself, with another Chavurah. So here's another similar, similarity between Pesach and Sukkot. But um, going back to Rabbi Eliezer's character, and my time is almost running up, so I really have to get things um, quicker. Um, there's a very famous saying in Masechet um, Avot, in the Mishnah, about Rabbi Eliezer, um, said from his Teacher, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. So Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai had five disciples, and they were these, Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkanus, Rabbi Yoshua ben Hanania, Rabbi Yosei the priest, Rabbi Shimon ben Etanel, and Rabbi Lazar ben Arach. And he used to list their virtues. Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkanus is a plastic cistern, a plastic pit, which loses not a drop. Okay, so the basic uh, characteristic or the basic notion of Rabbi Eliezer is his preserving. He preserves the Torah he receives without in a fully, in a maximum, without losing a drop, but also without changing or adding anything. Unlike Rabbi Eliezer, for example, Rabbi Eliezer ben Arach, Ma'ayan Hamitgaber, a rising spring. This is a different form of water, not preserving, but um, emerge, right, um, uh, flowing, original. Um, Rabbi Lazar ben Arach is an independent learner, as opposed to Rabbi Eliezer, who only says what he heard from his teachers. So now I think we can understand why halacha was not um, set according to Rabbi Eliezer, because Rabbi Eliezer represents what is stable, what is um, very um, strict, and this is uh, this approach does not suit the temporary and unstable nature of Sukkot, the holiday which sends us, as Rav Mimi said, sends us outdoors and asks us to remember the years of wandering in the wilderness. So this is why the halacha was not determined according to Rabbi Eliezer. The holiday of Sukkot really asks us um, requires us to be flexible and um, ask us to look at the temporary as our home for the Chag. So um, I would like to wish you all uh, happy and temporary <laughs> and flexible Chag Sukkot. And I do wish that you all feel at home wherever you are. Um, and Chag Sameach. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Gila Bachman. I um, learned a lot about so many Midrashim that uh, about uh, Sukkot that I um, didn't realize that they were, um, were happening. And now I'm happy to present uh, Dr. Shula Lederman, uh, who is a lecturer in Jewish art for the Schechter Institute. Um, hi, Shula.
Can you see us, Shura? Okay, in Ani. Ah, Mitsuyan. Okay. טוב, אני כבר רק רגע אשים את התריבה, אני אתחיל מההתחלה. אוקיי, okay, שלום לכולם. היי, to everybody. Um, this is uh, my, the last lecture and of today, and uh, I'm going to speak about the sukkah as the most meaningful architectural Uh, I mean, artistic Jewish architectural structure. And um, I'm bringing you here a picture that I'll get, come to it at the end. And what I'd like to show you at this lecture is how incredible the sukkah is. Uh, we are starting with um, art that we all know. I mean, more contemporary. I mean, this is um, a 19th century Oppenheim, Moritz Oppenheim, who lived in the ghetto. But uh, uh, I mean, he, he actually uh, was born when the ghetto was abandoned. But already, I mean, people didn't have to stay in the ghetto. But his whole being was to memorize and to kind of bring people back to the atmosphere of the ghetto. And um, here he show us, he's showing us the people sitting in the sukkah where you see the two Gentile boys looking at this family sitting in this temporary place outside. It's all decorated beautifully and the maid is bringing them uh, the food. And uh, it, it's very interesting to see that um, uh, this is really a, a, a structure that we know about and that Jewish families have been sitting in ever since the, the desert. And uh, it's kept ever since the exodus from Egypt. And we can see it in the art of um, Um, 19th century, we'll see it uh, uh, back in the Middle Ages, and we'll see it in 21st century also. Uh, now, this is really to keep this tradition, this collective memory of, of uh, the Israelite people in the both in the sand, in the desert when God brought them out of Egypt and they felt like to being under God's protection and other God's um, uh, providence. And here you can see we have here um, uh, um, um, a, a, foot, uh, um, a picture that um, says the Sukkot Tishru Shivat Yamim in Sukkot they are to sit temporary shelters for seven days. And we have this biblical command that is being kept up. And you could see all this Sukkot in Jerusalem. You can see everywhere the Sukkot build and, uh, and also in other places, of course. And uh, it's interesting to see that um, in the day, the, the fall season, when you finish the harvest, you finish gathering everything, that's when you have to leave your home and go to your permanent home and go to the temporary home that been discussed here over and over. And um, uh, for seven days, now here in the Israel Museum, we have a sukkah that was bought from Germany, for Southern Germany, a sukkah of the nine, from the 19th century. Again, you can see how people really invested a lot of energy in preparing beautiful sukkot in, with the pictures and the decoration. And this is a permanent display It was brought from Germany and we have it in the museum. And uh, of course, what's in, in, important here is to feel that um, there is a structure, but um, basically we don't have exact measurement for the sukkah. We have some basic rules that are and specifics uh, and specification that we know that it has to have at least uh, two and a half walls and it has to have uh, a schach that allows you to look at the sky and the, see the stars. And, um, and here was an example of such a, a structure that was prepared and being built every year. We have also Mark Chagall here in 1916, showing us the traditionally built sukkah where the men sit in the sukkah. We have a man with the uh, lulav and the four, uh, the four species, and we have them sitting and the woman is bringing them the food. And uh, obviously it was important for each of these artists to show us how uh, special the sukkah is when you come out of the home 
outside, and I'm sure that in Russia it was less present than in Israel when you have to uh, be in the Sukkah in the winter, t- I mean, in a harsher climate. Uh, I know I lived in Denver, Colorado, and we had to sometimes snow in the Sukkah. So, but in Israel, of course, we have uh, a very nice uh, uh weather and uh, sometimes it's very warm but but it's it's really giving us the feeling of being outside of being part of nature and if we look at the sukkot that um we have with uh, we have some kind of um uh, um knowledge of is we start seeing them pictures of them visualization of them we start seeing them in the middle ages when i wanted to look at uh early sukkot i opened machzorim ancient machzorim we have here a machzor from the um 14th century and what it was in the machzorim machzorim uh the collection of the different a tefillot to holidays. Machzor is a is a Ashkenazic invention where you don't have to to carry the whole sidu, but you have you arrange the piyutim, the poems and the and the liturgy according to the holidays. And here we have a a beautiful piyut ha'ametz, and it's a piyut praising God and. Uh, the word, uh, the initial word is decorated because in Latin manuscript, of course, we decorate the initial letter uh, in, in all the Latin languages. But in Hebrew, you cannot separate the initial letter. So you have the initial word the, uh, uh, that you decorate. And here you see each one of the letters is in its own block. And the frame is really the sukkah. What do we have here? We have here uh, a manuscript that this describes for us three branches, palm branches, which symbolize, or like Rabbi Mimi said, the metaphor of a sukkah is what you see here, these three branches that constitute a sukkah. So when we look carefully at medieval manuscript, we can learn how they understood the sukkah as a symbol. And um, and we uh, I brought few example like this one is a machzor from southern Germany from the 13th century and we have the words of the piyut of the poem mentioned in a in a very beautiful way to uh, uh, teach us that um, every word has a meaning but the meaning is from the Torah the piyut usually uses. Uh, phrases from the Bible and from Midrash and from different sources. This one is a piyut of Rabbi Elazar HaKalil, who was, um, you know, very famous uh, poem, a uh, paitan, and uh, and it it takes the words into the um, piyut that uh, are mentioned in the Torah. I will ascribe might unto all feared. And as I watch at his door, may I find redemption. So this is on the 15 days. Every word here means that it connects to a midrash because we are watching the redemption because we are outside and we are under God's wings. And the kavod under the uh, the uh, clouds of of God. And so this is how the Python plays with the words of the Torah and the explanation and creates this beautiful poem, this beautiful liturgy. And then the illustrator comes and he gives it the uh, symbol of the sukkah, that what's important is to have this frame that is botanical. It's something that is growing. And it also shows us the connection to nature and to God. Uh, and uh, in this, you could see different uh, uh, different kinds of references, like with might, maj- with majesty, will I clothe him that dwelleth in the heights, uh, loading him with my gift of perfect and unblemished branches. Unblemished branches 
refer to um, uh, to different kinds of things like it's a little love or it's the palm branches who crown him with adoration and glory branches of palm tree. Meaning we have here a usage of the Hebrew language and the poetry that brings together all the beautiful sources that we have. Now, a, all these verses uh, uh, have a lot of meaning in the uh, poetry. I mean, we went to uh, Yom Kippur now and, and Rosh Hashanah and we read a lot of Piyotim. And here we have more Piyotim that the, refer to the beauty of the holiday being a nature holiday. And here you can see another manuscript, and this is from the 14th century, it's called Piske Ishayau. It's a book of halachot, a book of Jewish law written in the 13th century by an Italian rabbi whose name was uh, Rabbi Ishaya de Trani, uh, the younger. And you see the decoration shows us a sukkah that is all branches. And it has a bench inside because you have to be able to go inside and eat and dwell here. But the main frame is the branches that you see here. Uh, we have another example of a beautiful manuscript from Emilia. Emilia is a 15th century manuscript of an Italian marzo from Emilia. And here the the illustrator wanted to point out to us how important the schach, the covering is, and the building of the poles. Now, we know that a sukkah has to have at least two and a half walls, but here they show us something that is in the halakha, that if, uh, if a, a pole uh, a, a has um, a, a way to be opened up, but uh, he, it could constitute like a wall. And here you can see the branches, the, the, uh, the flora that's wrapping around and creating this nature feeling and yet also is okay halacha wise. And then we see the family after they build the sukkah, we have them, um, you know, create the sukkah and then they sit in the sukkah. And this is very important to emphasize again the halakha or that were mentioned by by uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, lecturer that uh, you have to rejoice in the holiday. You have to have the family. Here we have the men, the men of the house, uh, uh, making a kiddush, and they have guests. And uh, and this is part of the nature of the holiday that's so emphasized in uh, right here in the um, uh, picture that you see. Uh, and uh, uh, important to 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 show the the thickness of the walls and the way they put the schachat and then to show the family eating and interestingly uh what's so nice in art from the middle ages is that we really are opening up like a window to see what our four forefathers look like. We see what they dress. This is Italy. They're wearing like Renaissance clothes. We see the uh, uh, the um, uh, lighting, which is the Judenstern, meaning the Jews used to have a, la uh, a candelabra that would be uh, allow them to light the candles and would look like a star, and then it could also serve as a lighting fixture. So all of this is uh, showing us the, uh, the, the genre of life in, back in the Middle Ages and the, the really importance that they gave to the sukkah and to the celebration in, in nice uh, dishes and, and with guests that is so important. Now, uh, in all this example that I bought from the Middle Ages, we can say that, um, that the sukkah from its very inception in the desert throughout the Middle Ages and up to the present day represents a unique sacred architecture that reflects a virtual reality set in time, acknowledging the changing of the season in space, a carefully defined temporary structure, and in thought, 
an allusion to collective national and religious memories of the tabernacle and the temple through which one can acquire a palatable sense of being close to God and his creation. So that the feeling of an aneka vod, of the, of the clouds of God, that the schach, and, and the, the, uh, on top symbolizes, creates that kind of a feeling that we have for seven days every year. Now, the interesting thing is here we were in the Middle Ages, and now I'm taking you on a tremendous journey up to the 21st century. After we saw the, um, the Sukkot, uh, the way uh, they were described in the Middle Ages and the way they are in in the uh, artists of the 19th century and 20th century, we come to the year 2010. And the year 2010, there was an architonic, uh, uh, there was a, a, a contest that was sponsored by Sucker City, New York. And they sent out um, uh, uh, a, a way to invite architects to create a sukkah sukkah that would fit their, their ideas of the 21st century. Then the Sukkot that would show 600 architects joined this exhibit. Uh, most of them were not Jewish. They were so excited with the rules that were given of what a sukkah should be that they created many different kinds of Sukkot and what you see here is Union Square, New York in September 2010. And here are the display of the 12 Sukkot that were chosen as uh, winners of the exhibit. And I'll show you some of them because it's really fascinating. Uh, here is, you have one uh, where, like I said, 600 architect designers and artists from around the world submitted original designs for modern day Sukkot. Now they were told what the rules of the Sukkah is, but they kind of interpreted it as a metaphor for ecology, for uh, in, the importance of nature, for the importance of, of preserving one's uh, community and a connection to the beauty of nature and many other things that I show you. The composition described in the competition, they described the sukkah in very contemporary terms, expressing universal ideas of transience and permanence, like it's been spoken about before, as expressed in architecture. How do you do, how do you create a structure that is both transient and permanent? So here you have a design, a design, a repetitious. That's the way they wrote it. Repetitions meets difference. Stability meets violet, volatiliness. And this, uh, uh, this is the artist that made this. Uh, another one, the sukkah, is a means of ceremoniously practicing homelessness, while at the same time remaining deeply rooted. So here, you have an example of, a, of an artist who created this, called it Shim Sukkah. And he says that here, it's on one hand, it's, it's homelessness. It's outside. It's not a permanent home. Very temporary, but it's still deeply rooted. It has to have um, uh, material that is... Um, um, uh, grow is something that that is from nature and it has the uh, the top and, and it has to be able to see the stars and to be part of nature. Another example, it calls on us to acknowledge the changing of season, to reconnect with an agricultural past and to take a moment to dwell on and dwell in impermanence. And here is the example that was chosen. This, this won the first prize. Uh, it was called Fractured Bubble. Two artists that made it, 
And they wanted to create this feeling that here is, we have, um, you know, things growing, but they're not, they're not from the ground, but they are uh, botanical things, but they allow space inside to celebrate the holiday. So this is knowing the season, being aware of nature around you and being in touch with the agriculture. Another example is what you see here. Uh, historically, the sukkah's permanent recurrence is not as a monument archetype or typology, but as a set of price of a precise parameters. I mean, there is different parameters that you have to obey. And here it meets the Talmud. Um, uh, they feel that that was one of the ways to have be able to see the stars and to see nature around you and to be able to uh, feel the uh, permanence, but not a monumental structure. Another idea is the idea that you see here. The basic constraint uh, seems simple. The structure must be temporary, have at least two and a half walls, be big enough to contain a table and have roof made, uh, made, uh, made of uh, shade providing orga organic material uh, through which you could see the stars. So they took this thread like um, that they created from it, from this, the sukkah to fulfill this, uh, this kind of an instruction. This one is my favorite. This is an amazing one. This is called Sukkah of the Signs. What does it mean, Sukkah of the Signs? What do we see here? We see many signs here that have stuff written on it. The Sukkah itself is built of a thin wood, like a very thin wood. And these two artists went around all over San Francisco Oakland, the Bay Area, and they went to homeless people and bought from them the cardboard signs that they either slept on or um, used to, um, uh, to collect money. They bought it with money and then they pasted them, they glued them onto their sukkah. And they call this the paradoxical effect of this constraint is to produce a building that is at the at one at once new and old, timely and timeless, mobile and stable, open and closed, homey and uncanny, comfortable and critical, to comply. Sorry, just a minute. To comply with the sukkah requirements. The makers of this sukkah use special thin wood that will look like cardboard, but will qualify as a natural growing material. And on it, like I said, they went around and bought all of these signs and glued them on to kind of give the feeling that by having a sukkah and creating this uh, temporary feeling where we really in a way are homeless, we come out of our home and we have a, a, a very temporary homeless type house, we are to really connect with people who's not just seven days are homeless, but their whole life is to deal with homelessness. And the interesting thing is that um, at the end of this exhibit, what they did was they sold all of those creations and get, they gave the money to homeless people. So this was their way of connecting and, and tying the ideas of sukkah to, uh, to, the, uh, to homeless people, but also to become aware of the needs that we have to, towards nature and uh, the responsibility we have to feel part of nature, to be ecological, to be uh, aware of the seasons and to be aware of 
climate changes and all of that. So the sukkah's distinctive characteristics are really evident in images found starting with the Mahzorim, where it's really metaphors to the beautiful words of the Piyutim and trying to visualize the ideas of the liturgy of the holiday and show how it connects with the ideas of the things we have to have for the holidays, the sukkah, the four species, the lulav, etc. So that by seeing those machzorim that we looked at from the 13th, 14th, 15th century, all these illuminated manuscripts uh, that included uh, liturgy and halachic legal guidance for the construction of the sukkah, and seeing the special piyutim. The piyutim is another way of, of creating artistic expressions of a beautiful holiday like the Sukkot, and bringing the simcha, the samachta b'chagecha, through the text of the poetry. And it's so interesting to see that uh, all of this uh, creation was so exciting to so many people who were not even Jewish, but felt that all of these uh, principles around the sukkah speak to them. The interesting thing is the man that, um, create, that was the head of this contest, his name is Bennett. Now, I don't know if he's a relation to, to our prime minister, but uh, it, it, it seemed like such a genius kind of a way to publicize the beauty of the holiday of Sukkot and the simcha that we have uh, by celebrating it. So thank you very much. Wow, uh, Shula, this was so uh, amazing to see um, and a way to make me feel bad about my sukkah. <laughs> Um, but really, really beautiful and, and incredible, um, inspiring Sukkot and, and the meaning uh, behind it was also outstanding. Thank you very, very much. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today for our Zooming into Sukkot of the Shechter Institute. Um, I had a great time uh, uh, getting to know you better and, and listening to all the really interesting and, and inspiring lectures. Um, and I really, really hope that um, very soon we will be meeting again. Uh, if you would like, all the uh, lectures are recorded and are available on our YouTube channel. Um, and we just want to wish you Chag Tamech, Moadim Simcha. We hope you have a beautiful and interesting and joyous holiday. And thank you very much for joining us today. Later